Okay, okay Ronnie. So I'm going to ask you. Um, Psycho Psycho was released in 2004, which is a fantastic album. Then you guys went quiet. What actually happened? What went wrong? Well, it was just um, we kind of got together for Psycho Psycho because the guy from Crook Records, which was doing lowbrow, and he was just a nasty, savage, big fan, and he just wanted to spend money and hang out with Nasty Savage, I think. So he wanted to uh, – he started his own label and did lowbrow and all this, and then he wanted to do a Nasty Savage. He brought us all back together, and we really came together because of that. I mean, he paid us and paid for the recording, and you know, he did all this work. And um, that kind of brought us together. So once we were done, we really didn't have any real big plans. And the the record company kind of went defunct. So we really didn't know what to do. We just kind of went back to what we were doing. <laughs> you know, just kind of, you know, it, just, it was just a thing at the time to do it, to see what happened and kind of got lost with everything else. Because nowadays, man, you know, back in the days, we used to lick stamps and send demo tapes, hundreds and hundreds of demo tapes. And I never got training. one, unfortunately. <laughs> I never got one. Oh, it never got one. No, it sucked, man. I think I, I think I actually wrote to you through Metal Forces magazine because he used to have a demo section. So I used, to, I used to write to bands from there and just say, I do a fanzine in England. Can you send me a demo? And some bands didn't. Obviously, some bands didn't get me get my letters. So I guess I was one of the unfortunate ones. Yeah, because we, man, I swear I used to send out tons of demo tapes and to underground radio stations. And, you know, nowadays it's all on digital and just they just email it or text. You know, it, people don't know how hard it was back then to put up flyers and, oh, you yeah. know, promote those. And, you know, just wow. Back then it was. But we, we really counted on the, the fanzines. Or so, and Metal Forces was one of the most awesome um, magazines that, used to support metal, you know, Kick-Ass Monthly was another one from America, but, you know, and then Kerrang! came out and went a little more commercialized, Metal Hammer, and, you know, then there was just great, and then the regular old fanzines, the paper ones that the kids put together. And, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was, that's what it was about, man, and, you know, then trading tapes and, yeah. you know, giving them to other people to understand. So what, what I would do is, when people ordered a demo, we sold over 4,000 demo tapes. But what I would do is when someone would order one, like I knew when I hung out, I hung out with like 10, 5, 15 different metalheads in my town that we hung out, you know? So I knew if I got something in the mail really cool, I would show my friends, say, look what I got. Damn, look, he sent extra stuff. He signed it. <laughs> so then I would do that. And then they would order too and not just tape it. You know, the ones who really cared, I would I would always try to make it their special day when they got that package or they might have blood or, you know, all <laughs> kinds of crazy pictures or autograph stuff or extra T-shirt. You know, we just I would do I just knew how important it was, you know, to uh, but the fanzines. Another thing I would do, I would supply the fanzines and the editors with what they needed to do a good feature. So, yeah, I'd get good f photographs, a demo tape, a press release. Hell, if I'm a pr promote, I'm a producer, a publisher now, so that's what you need is the content. But I had that vision back then. If I could supply you with everything you needed, you, you were going to be excited and do a nice big feature. <laughs> and, of course, then they would say, this is how you get the demo tape. And so it was just really common sense marketing back then. Biggest bang for your buck. And like the radio stations, I had a list. Every college in America had a underground metal show in the 80s. And I would sit back and send a demo tape to every single one of them within you know six months. I do 10 at a time, five at a time. And um, I'd look at the station and I'd, I had room on my the end of the demo and I, I had a rock box. So I'd hit play and record and I could say something at the end of the tape. So I go, this is Nasty Ronnie from Nasty Savage here on KPFT, Houston, Texas. And here's a song off our demo tape, Wage of Mayhem. This is Unchained Angel. You know, so if I'm a DJ and I get that, I'm going to go, holy shit, this is cool. Yeah. So what do you think? You know, they're going to play it. And yeah, so a friend of mine used to work for Metal Forces. You'll probably know him, Mike Exley. 
Oh, yeah, I remember Mike. Yeah, Mike's a good friend of mine, yeah. We keep in touch a lot. You want to tell him, you know, tell him we had this conversation. He'd be watching it, he'd be watching it. (laughs) Tell him. (laughs) Because in those days, it was all about, man, the, the fanzine. So I would send that stuff out. And maybe four months later, three months later, I get these packages in the mail and we'd be on the cover of this one and the cover of that one. And it helped us get signed to Metal Blade. It helped us get gigs. And, you know, people knew Nasty Savage before we even had a record deal. It was just off the demo tape. Because yeah. we had these extreme photos and images, you know, and I knew that's what we needed. I'd always have photographers at our gigs. I mean, you was like, you was like, you was like, uh, a bondage gladiator back in the day, weren't you? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it was just how extreme can you go? You know, you know what is metal? This is metal, you know, and and people love that shit. And you know, it was just the impact. You know, I remember at World War Three Festival in Montreal, Canada, with Voivod, Celtic Frost, Destruction, and Possessed, and Nasty Savage. We had the stage, you know, and we had to do something when we had it. And I remember I had that whole get up there and the smashed even TVs there. Are you still doing all that smashing TVs? You still do all that? Hell yes. Hell (laughs) yes. That's when I talk about burning images in people's brains. Uh, We definitely get blood, blood, uh, bloody. Uh, There's a mess. I work. I have flowers for the sacrifice of the television Uh, with the morgue. I bring out these flowers and I wear a skull mask, you know, and. I really bring people's emotions into what's going on. And then I'll smash the TV, but I'll mess with sort of like a bullfighter, man, in, in Mexico or Spain. You know, when when you go to a bullfight, you know what's going to happen at the end, right? Yeah. You know what's going to happen to the bull. So, but the whole time they work the bull, work it, work it, work it. And they kind of take you along for this ride. And that's kind of what I do at the TV set. You know, I really have a, a relationship with those TVs for some reason. I, you know, I didn't have it in 88 in Europe. So. so what would you do if you was playing live and you had a TV on your head and it came alive and people started watching it before you smashed it? <laughs> That'd be kind of funny. Well, <laughs> they're watching it the whole time, man, when, when I'm doing it because I'm making them watch. I'm making them come inside the TV with me and, and take this trip and take this journey and, and follow along on this um, on this storyline that I'm giving them, and and you know what? At the end, it's like wow, the people freak out, man. And and you know, uh, like in in the last show we did in in, in uh, Chicago, and they don't know what to think, man. It, and these young kids today, they don't know what they're about to see. They might have only heard about Nasty Savage, or maybe not even heard about it. So I'm always like, we're always like, like a Dale Carnegie class, win friends and influencing people, you know, it's like, hell, glad, damn glad to meet you. Uh, this is nasty savage and you're not going to forget it, you know, and, and, and that's what we have to do, man. I mean, that's our reputation on the line. So the TV sets are, uh, it's just a gimmick that I've always done, but it's a tool, you know, maybe it represents uh um, it represents what's going on with brainwashing and how people try to push uh, ideas in your head and or make you watch brainwashing stuff. And so I use it as a form of breaking it all to, to not worry about what people tell you what to do. It's maybe it's just it's just entertainment. And that's all it really is, is entertaining to me. You know, people try to figure it out. Um, I don't think anybody else is doing that in heavy metal these days. No, so, I mean, you you were a wrestler at one point, weren't you? Because I remember you had a little, little feud with Billy Milani. I remember you telling me you're going to kill him and all this shit. <laughs> did, you, did you ever become friends in the end? Well, well, what happened, it was because of Metal Forces. I did this interview. It was called 9 to 5 with Nasty Ronnie. And then the next month they did one with Billy Milano. And uh, they said something about something. And, and he said, oh, yeah, that Nasty Ronnie's a poser. Uh, I could kick his ass. He, he smashes a fake TV. I could kick his ass in five seconds. <laughs> yeah, so that's what he said in Metal Forces. In Metal Forces, of course, they said, hey, Nasty Ronnie, look what Billy Malone said. So I said, oh, really? Well, they go, what do you have to say? And I said, well, if I ever meet him, I'll have a stopwatch. So that's <laughs> what I said. 
<laughs> and then we were in New Jersey not too long after that. And we were playing a gig. We just did CBGBs, and we were with Whiplash and Hallow's Eve and Nasty Savage. And I look out in the crowd when I was on stage, and I saw, I go, that's fucking Billy Milano right there. <laughs> I go, oh, shit. So as soon as we were done, I just started bird dogging the whole audience. So I, and I kept looking and looking. I go, I know he's in here. I know he's in it. And then I saw him go into the bathroom. Oh, so I said, oh, shit. Now, back then, I was pretty, I was not a big guy, really. I was about 180 pounds, maybe, not even 200 pounds, maybe close to 200. Uh, so he's a big dude, really wide, like a big bowling ball, you know. And I'm like, fuck it. I said, he's going in the bathroom. I'm going in there. So I walk in there, and he's taking a leak, right? So I, I walk in, I put my hand behind his head. I push his, I push his head up against the wall. And I got him pinned to the wall. And he's like, what the fuck? I go, hey, Billy. I pushed it up and said, it's Nasty Ronnie. And I brought my stopwatch. He goes, oh, brother. Zipping up his pants. Oh, brother, man. Uh, I'm sorry. I was having a bad time, man. My dad passed away. And, you know, it just wasn't good. I go, well, you know what, man? I'm I'm here to, to protect my honor. You know, and it ended up that we didn't fight or nothing. But Dan Linker from... Uh, nuclear assault was in the bathroom and so was Richard, my bass player. And it was always so cool when Richard would tell that story when we were out and about doing stuff. Richard would tell that story so awesome. And uh, But we became friends and everything. And matter of fact, I think we're still friends on Facebook now. That's good. But back then, you know, I really didn't want to fight him, you know, but, but I was going to uphold my honor to fight because you got to, you know. Yeah. I'd fight anybody back then. I was just stupid. You know, just thinking <laughs> fighting was cool. It's it's really not cool. Yeah. No. But when you're young and dumb, you know, you, you do stupid things. But when it comes to your honor and your name and representing who you are, you don't back down. And and that's all I knew is that there's the guy that said talk shit about me. <laughs> so but, but I'm glad it worked out for the best. But it was pretty funny that uh, Richard was there to tell the story. Wow. So so the new lineup then, who, what bands were they in before they came to Nasty Savage? Well, um, James Coker, the drummer, he was in Brutality. Oh, I know those guys. They did a Nuclear Blast yeah, Records. Man. He's just a great guy. Just a really, just a really real kind of guy. And uh, a real kind of soul, you know, and just really cool and mellow. He's the coolest guy, and he's a badass drummer. And he actually has been with Nasty Savage for a long time. And Curtis was out of the band. He played uh, Bang Your Head twice with us in, in Germany. Yeah, I've been there. It's a good festival. Yeah, man. Uh, really good ones. And, and he was with us then, so he's been with us a long time. Pete Sykes came on board um, pretty much when we got back with Nasty Savage. Pete and Jim were together, and, and they would jam with Richard. So when I put the band back together with David Austin, actually David Austin really wasn't jamming with us then either. After we all broke up or whatever, um, I was, they found out, David found out that I was getting this band back together and calling it Nasty Savage. And he, he reached out and said, dude, I want to do it. So we got David and then we got Pete and Richard came with Pete. And so the gym, so that was three and we had, that was our band you know right there and uh we did our we started jamming and played a lot of shows over the last few years and then uh richard kind of got out of the band we took a hiatus and then he had his fatal accident that happened to him and he died and then um that's when we brought in scott carino uh he was in fester he was in lowbrow he played in death uh pete pete as a guitarist played in um Oh shit! He's a real um, like a ripping guitarist, uh, shredder guy, and he played with uh, Jim. Oh man, another really pretty killer death metal band. I can't think of it right now. Uh, but Pete's uh, just another great guy, hardworking guy. He believes in the the past of Nasty Savage. He wants to uphold the tradition, but he also wants to bring some new stuff to the table. He's a hardworking guy. He's got the band room the jam room that we practice in and uh you know scott carino is just an amazing bass player and uh, he's played in a lot of bands so that that's really where we're at now and then and then dave orman uh jammed with pete when david left 
we were like, oh, shit, man, how are we going to replace David? And then Pete goes, well, I got this guy. And then Dave just is a real kind of classical guitarist as well. He could play like Al Di Miola and stuff like that or just the shredding, uh, hypnotic, mind-bending guitar stuff too. So, um, God, I can't think of the band they were in, but it was another heavy band. So yeah, it's kind of cool that they've all jammed together. You know, It made it a lot easier to, to get people to get involved. So how many new songs have you wrote? Have you got enough material for a new album? Uh, we have probably about four four or five, I think. And that's what we might do. We might just do a, like a demo tape like the old days, four songs. Send me, it. Send me one, please, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we have, um, there's a guy named Dylan Lafortier, and he does this thing called Head Split Records. Out of, he's in a band, too, but there, he's out of Portland. And he... Um, he re-released the demo tape on cassette. So we, we actually have some demos still. We redid it. And we put some extra, a couple extra songs on there. Right. So I, I think I might have a couple laying around somewhere. All right, because I've, I've, actually, I've actually watched a couple of YouTube footage of you guys. It might be on your Facebook page or YouTube. A rehearsal, mm -hmm. a recent rehearsal where you're just jamming without vocals. Is that the instrumental that you played live? Because yeah, it sounded really good. That was that is that band. That's the song, The Sixth Finger. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we played it. It's on YouTube, too. If you go to YouTube, uh, Metal Threat uh, in Chicago, we played it live on stage. Sounds a lot better there. But, um, yeah, so that's what we'd probably do. We're, we're going to get, like, four songs, record them, get them out there and see who wants to do something, and then hopefully we'll be able to, you know, write, really writing some more as well. So what's the song um, titles for this for you've got so far for these songs? You've got Six well, Fingers. The, the Sixth Finger is one of them. Um, I always wanted to write about the Aztecs and the blood, you know, the blood gods and all that stuff and the Mayans, you know. And so I came up with this title called Aztec Elegance. And it's just really cool. There's, this, there's a movie called Apocalypto. Have you seen it? It's from Mel Gibson produced. He was the director. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Apocalypto, man. It's so awesome. And uh, so I kind of got inspired by that. And that, that's the one of them. I want to tell you all of them, you know, because too much steal the, the titles. Uh, there's one called um, Operation Annihilate. It's another cool one. Um, and there's a few others, you know. Um, but they're all going to be brutal. The one called Jeopardy Room, another one. So, yeah, man, it's like I was excited about, you know, Psycho Psycho. I'm really excited about this next uh, this next chapter. So is this a, follow a continuation of Psycho Psycho, what you're doing now? Is it completely heavier, but it's still Nasty Savage? Is it the next chapter? Yeah, you know, um, I I'm, I'm really pushing the guys to take it to another level. And they're worried about, oh, we need to keep it like, 80s nasty savage i'm like dude this is a new chapter let's not worry about what anybody else thinks what anybody else says all we're in control of is our future let's make it heavier let's make it more complex let's make it more death sound i don't know you know it's just like i think they're gonna hold to the beliefs of 80s style you know nasty savage vein out of respect and i'm okay with whatever they do and, and that's pretty much you know progressive heavy complex you know that style they're still gonna have that 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 wee guitar tone in it like you've always had judging by yeah. the instrumental that i've heard yeah it's gonna be it, it, it's gonna be whatever it is it's gonna be nasty savage and you know like i said it, there's gonna be plenty of people who have never even heard of nasty savage out of here for the first time probably you know so i mean it, what's what's cool too is when we go to these shows now, the fathers are there with their sons, <laughs> and they're bringing the next generation. You know, Edu educating the youngsters. Yeah, I really dig that, man. I'll pull them on stage. I'll stop the show. I'll make a proclamation. I'll testify with the dad, and the, you know, it's really amazing. Matter of fact, when we were in Portland, um, I was when I do the morgue, I talk about. If you're not talking to somebody in your life right now, make the call, man. You know, I lost somebody and we weren't talking and make the call, you know, you know, because you might end up seeing them 
in the morgue and then the morgue starts you know then, then i act out that tragedy with the skull mask and the flowers and i start using the tv as a as a sacrifice to the the morgue and you know sorrow sorrow but then i'll I'll pick out, I picked out a father and son. They go, this is his dad. I go, is anybody here tonight with your dad? And this guy goes, oh. and I pull him and his dad on stage. And it just made their night that I, I honored them. And I said, people, bring it together, father and son. You know, how, you know, people dig that. You know, they're like, hell yeah. So um, not long after that, we became pretty good friends. Not long after that, his dad passed away. And he told me about it. And I was like, oh, man. So then when we played in Ohio, they came from Portland to Ohio to the show. And he made this nasty, savage jacket. It was unbelievable. And I pulled him up on stage and we honored his dad before the morgue. And, you know, it was, it was just really, really special to me to, to touch people with emotion, whether it's highs or lows. It's like a roller coaster ride of emotion. And if you can get people... To feel that whatever it is, happiness, sadness, you have them. And those are things you don't forget. And as a performer, that's the kind of stuff I really look for is uh, how do I get to these people's heart, mind and soul? Yeah. So are you planning on doing any touring in Europe this year? Has any agencies been in touch with you to say, hey, we need you to come over here? You, you know, we hear you touring at the minute in the States and playing festivals well, or whatever. Yeah. You know, um, actually, we're talking to guys in, in Holland. Later in the year, Holly, two shows in Germany, maybe, and one in uh, Belgium. And we're talking to a guy, a promoter in South America for uh, about 10 shows in, in South America from Mexico to Brazil. Wow. And in between, you know, back uh, before COVID, we played, we headlined um, Santiago, Chile, a metal fest. And then we headlined in Lima, Peru as well in a metal fest. And so we, we've, you know, we've been getting out there doing some shows. We played LA, Texas, you know, we've done a, quite a few off shows throughout the year, but we never really do any big long tours. But um, I was talking to somebody yesterday in England, actually. Um, and he was like, dude, I could set you up with this guy and that guy and, or these clubs. I said, we don't deal with the clubs. We, we need a promoter who's out there and says, hey, we want to bring Nasty Savage and we'll give you like three or four shows. I don't think we're in for 30 shows or 15 shows. And, you know, we're pretty old now. So it's, it's hard. Everybody's got jobs and stuff. But, you know, we can pretty much get away. But just got to be smart about it. You know? Well, if you need a drum tech, Ronnie, I'm, I actually drum tech for uh, Anvil from Canada. Oh, that'd be awesome. I'm, I'm Rob Reiner's tech for the UK, for Europe and UK. So if you need a tech or if you know any bands that do need one, please spread the word for me. I'd appreciate that. Yeah, that would be definitely cool. You know, it'd really be nice to have a sound man when we go because, you know, with doing the high vocals and stuff, you, sometimes you're at the mercy of a sound guy who, you know, they just don't. It helps if you get a little of this and a little of that and they know when to give it to you effect-wise. Especially not, if they know your music, that helps. Yeah, man. It's the worst nightmare I ever had is when I play live at these festivals or, I'll go to the sound man. We'll get a sound check, and by the time we play, they're like half asleep and burn out. And you know, and I'm, I'm like, I'll pay him some money. I go, look, here's twenty bucks, man, as a tip. I said, after we're done, if you take care of me, I'll give you some more. But take care of me, and then and, you know, half the time, it just sucks, you know. And it, so if I had my own sound man, that would really be good too. Right, just okay. an added chance for an, a promoter to to bring in an extra guy. Right then, Ronnie, I'd like to thank you for doing this interview. I wish you all the best. Please keep in touch. Let me know how you're getting on with the band. I'm here for if you need me for anything. So I'd like to say thank you. Wish you all the best today. And do you have anything to say to the people watching this on YouTube? No, I just want to thank you for everything you've done for uh, the many years that you've uh, supported metal and the bands that you've helped throughout the way, including Nasty Savage. And Thank you. There's nothing like old friends uh, because of heavy metal to bring us together. And, you know, those are friends forever, you know, and, and metals forever. And just be true to what you do, guys. And, 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 and be true to your family and your kids, your, your parents and your job, your boss, whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability. Be true and be honest, you know, and, and if we all did good things, the world would be a better place, you know. 
help the old lady across the street, man. Move the turtle out of the road. It doesn't matter, you know. Uh, let somebody get in front of you in traffic, you know. Just, you know, be kind to others. I think this whole world needs more kindness in it. You know, it doesn't matter what politics you're at or where you, what color you are. Just, just enjoy your life, man, and and be kind. And if we're all kind, heavy metal will be even better. Right. Thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate that. So take care of yourself. Keep in touch. Yeah, one other thing. They could go to uh, our, our Facebook page. Like our Facebook page, guys. It's um, Nasty Savage Wage of Mayhem. Just go to Nasty Savage Wage of Mayhem. And you know what? If you tell me you saw me on this interview, I might just send you a T-shirt or a demo. You never know. But I'm, in. To, I'm in. <laughs> go, to, go, to, go to Nasty Savage Wage of Mayhem. Like it and send me a message, and we'll go from there, guys. Thank you so much. All right, let's do it, brother. Cheers, brother. Take care, Ronnie. Keep in touch. Bye, brother. Yeah, good night. Bye-bye, Matt.